So we're going to continue talking about orthogonal projections. And uh, last week we talked about projecting onto a vector. I mean, if we have two vectors, we can take one of them and decompose it in this way. And that was called an orthogonal projection. Well, you could do the same thing if instead of having a line, you had, say, a plane in three-dimensional space. So like if you have a plane and you have um, the XY plane and you have some vector, you can project that vector down orthogonally onto the XY plane. And that's what we want to talk about today. So a plane is a subspace in R3. It's a two-dimensional subspace to be precise. So when we talk about this, we'll talk about it in terms of subspaces. Let's say we're in Rn and W is some kind of subspace. And we have a vector y, then we can always write this vector y as y equals y at plus z. So just what we were doing uh, last Thursday with a few modifications. Previously, y hat was a scalar multiple of this vector. Now y hat just has to be in the plane. And as for z, z was this vector. z had to be orthogonal to this vector. Now z has to be orthogonal to this thing. In other words, z has to be, and we can always write. Now Z has to be in the orthogonal complement of the plane. But it's pretty much what we did yesterday with uh, W instead of a single vector. And let me add a word here. There's only one way to do this. That is to say that y hat is unique and that z is unique. You can't have, you can't have this vector projected on say right sort of onto the plane orthogonally in more than one way which is probably obvious now that I've drawn this picture. I mean, this clearly, this second vector I drew, clearly isn't in fact hitting the plane at a right angle. There was just one way of doing that. 
We can think of what we did yesterday as a special, not yesterday, but last Thursday, as a special case of this, by the way. I mean, if this vector down here, if we called it V, then the span of V is a vector space. And what we did last Thursday is just a special case of what we're doing today, where the space W is one dimensional. I say we can do this. Um, last Thursday, when we were doing this over here, we had an actual form diva for doing it. Um, we have a, or we can write a form diva telling us how to find y at and how to find z, but there are some restrictions here that we'll have to deal with. First, let me give y hat an alternative bit of notation, proj for projection onto W of Y. So the advantage of that notation, of course, is that it tells us what the vector Y is, and it tells us what space we're projecting on to, whereas the notation Y hat doesn't tell us any of those things. But going back to what I said about a formula, Suppose W has an orthogonal basis. Uh, U1, U2, up to you yeah. And it's going to turn out that every vector space does have an orthogonal basis. And not only that, but we're going to learn an explicit method for taking a non-orthogonal basis and making it orthogonal. So this isn't as big of an assumption as it might seem, but we do need an orthogonal basis. Then y hat is given by a formula, kind of a tedious formula, just lots of dot products and stuff. I mean, so far, this formula should seem familiar. It was what we had last Thursday. Uh, but now we're going to add, you know, this term comes from the first basis vector. There's a second term coming from the second basis vector, and so on down the line. Each of these basis vectors gets dotted with Y. Then each of these basis vectors gets dotted with itself. Then we do this division. Then we do the scalar multiplication. All of these quotients are being scalar multiplied by basis vectors. Finally, we add all of these up. 
So it's extremely thug and fay. I mean, obviously, if you have a large basis, this becomes immensely tedious to do. Like, if W is a 10-dimensional space, then you have 10 of these terms being added up. That's probably a job for a computer rather than pen and pencil. But the, um, the actual formula is just fug and fay. So like say, for example, the W is the span of two, five, negative one, negative two, one, one. And this is a subspace of R3. And these vectors here are a basis. Um, they are linearly independent. They're a spanning set. So they're a basis, and what's more, you can verify that they're an orthogonal basis. Line them up, do the dot product, we get a negative four, a negative one, a positive five, add those all together, we do indeed get to zero. So this is an orthogonal basis. And let's say we have some vector y. Say one, two, three. If we want to take this Y and project it onto W, Y hat equals, and now this kind of tedious plug and say, we dot the Y and the basis vectors together. And we get, let's see if I can just do this, two and 10 and negative three. So um, 12 minus three, I make that dot product nine. And then we dot the basis vector with itself. So four and 25 and one, uh, I make the dot product of that basis vector with itself out to be 30. And then Once we have that fraction, we scale or multiply the basis vector. And then we just repeat this pattern. With the other basis vector. So the dot product of y with that basis vector, I make to be negative two, positive two, three. I make that dot product to be three. The dot product of the basis vector with itself, I make to be four and one and one. So I make that six, and then we 
scale their multiply with that basis vector. And let me see. Nine thirtieths would be three tenths. So this doesn't look three sixths would be uh, one half, which would be five tenths. So let's see, six tenths, 15 tenths, negative three tenths, plus negative 10 tenths, five tenths, five tenths. If I haven't done anything goofy with my arithmetic, which you can never absolutely count on, but as I say, if I haven't done anything silly, um, then this is why. And we uh, we can find Z as well if we want it. I mean, I only here I only explicitly gave a form to the for Y hat. But Y equals Y hat plus Z. So if we wanted Z. It could be gotten simply by subtracting those vectors. Let me make a note. We have observed that in a lot of applications, we really want to be working with the unit to vectors. Vectors, um, that is vectors whose length is one. Um, one nice thing that happens if we're using unit vectors is that that form to the or y hat simplifies if we have an orthonormal basis. Uh, and that's just because if we have an orthonormal basis, all of the dot products in the denominator turn to one. So we just get y dot what u1 times u1, y dot u2 times u2, and so on. Let me state a few quick theorems. I'm going to let you go very early today, but whatever, it's the long weekend. Um, theorem, if Y is in W, then the projection of Y onto W is just why. I mean, 
I hope that's I hope that's intuitive. If we have this vector space and we have this vector that's in the vector space, it's its own projection. The next theorem is more interesting and significant, a very significant theorem. The projection of Y onto W is the vector in W that's closest to Y. And this should be, I'm not going to give a formal proof, but this I hope is geometrically clear. If we've got W and we've got some vector not in W, then the point in W closest to that vector is here. It's, I mean, I'm, well, I'm talking in terms of points. The point on this line closest to this point is this point here. And that's then, that's then this vector y hat. So, yeah, I mean, this is, I hope, geometrically intuitive. If I ask, like, what's the point on this wall that's closest to me? It's obviously not anything over there. It's the point on the wall directly to a right angle of me. I mean, it's the point that I go to if I just go straight to the wall and form my path forms a right angle to the wall. So this is simply saying that. This, as I say, is very significant. I mean, I'm sort of might be making it sound when I say, oh, well, hopefully this is obvious. Being obvious is not the same thing as being unimportant. This is ultimately how we're going to learn to do a polynomial regression. We're going to look at polynomial regression in terms of solving a system of linear equations that doesn't have solutions. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to say, okay, we don't have any solutions. What's the closest that we can come to being a solution? And we're going to address that question using this theorem. If here are, if here are the things with, solutions, and here's the thing we want to solve, it doesn't have a solution, we perform an orthogonal projection, and that gives us the system that does have solutions, that's as close to this as possible, and then we solve the system that has solutions. Uh, well, that's a few sections off. Um, for now, that's the end of this section. And as I say, I certainly don't want to get halfway through the next section and then have a week-long break. So even if it's quite early, we'll just end our lecture here. I hope that all of you have a... Uh...